Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. The Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage, rooted in the Jewish value of respect for all humanity, explores stories of courage from history and today with a commitment to education so that there can be a more inclusive tomorrow. The Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage exists to stop the hate. Good evening, I'm Daryl McNair. And I'm Dahlia Fisher. Welcome to the Maltz Museum's 14th Annual Stop the Hate Awards Ceremony. A big night with big prizes. $100,000 in prizes. That's right. Tonight, we're awarding $100,000 in scholarships, prizes, and anti-bias education grants to Northeast Ohio students, schools, and educators for being the change they want to see in their communities. Let's meet a few of them right now. Yes, great idea. Hate is an equalizer. Everyone is subject to it, whether they know it or not, whether they were the hater or the hated. You're such a downy. My head whipped around so fast. Staring him down, I said, you know, my sister has Down syndrome. Hey, Biggie, the boy shouted. You don't belong here. Those Asian kids stink. Oh, you go to that white school with all them white people. That must be why you talk like them. We saw some other girls playing house. They're pretending to be family. We walked over and asked to play with them. One of the little girls said cruelly, no, you guys are black. The N-word had been screamed in my presence. Suddenly, I felt a thick rope around my neck slowly becoming tighter each second. I began gasping for air. The background noise was filled with laughter from my peers. People called me a terrorist. Sometimes, they would even make bombing jokes. Wherever I go, I face stares that are filled with discontentment, as if people want to say, you're a terrorist or oppressed. The staring chokes me. Fighting racism is a never-ending battle. There is still so much work to be done. Judging someone for being mentally ill is the same as judging someone because of their race or religion. I learned about the vandalization of my great-grandfather's gravesite at a Jewish cemetery in Cleveland. Why do people hate others so much? I know that there will always be those who try to put us down because of the way we look. Race, gender, size, ethnicity, sexuality. Why is it shamed upon to discuss normal and healthy topics about our evolving bodies? Yes, I'm deaf, and so is my sister, my father, and my aunt too. It runs in the family. Then my teacher told me, how sad. I'm so sorry to hear that. Sad, I never thought of our deafness as something sad. Then I asked myself, how did it change the way people think? I work to create positive change in my school in my community. I knew my school needed social justice reform. Students and staff were forced to face what goes on in our high school. When I see kids sitting alone during class, I sit with them. Being kind to others is so important. You can make a difference and speak up. Having courage can change your future. We must unite to combat hate so it does not equalize us. Rather, it should be the thing we all condemn. Worth cannot be singularly defined, not by gender, race, socioeconomic status, or anything for that matter. By advocating for peace and order between all faiths, we can move forward as a united and peaceful people to stop the hate. Wow, these kids are amazing. It's also amazing that there's this platform for us to hear their voices. There are two people who deserve special recognition for creating this platform and the Stop the Hate program who also happen to be the co-founders of the Mulch Museum of Jewish Heritage. Allow me to introduce to you Milt and Tamar Maltz. It's not a very pretty story, but it was my first encounter with what I called anti-Semitism of that era. There were no buses in those days for children, so we had to walk. So at five years of age, I walked my 10 blocks. And when I got there, there were a group of fellows that were much older. They surrounded me and they said, you're a Christ killer. 
they began to tear off my clothes. I had nothing on me other than my shoes, stockings, and underwear. I wrenched myself free and I ran, didn't walk home the 10 blocks. And I was crying and I told my mother, who is Christ? This was my first encounter with anti-Semitism. Once you've been the victim of hate, you have a feeling that other kids need help. congratulate all of them. We wish you all the best of luck. All I can say is... You're great. Amen. <laughs> Milton Tamar, thank you for laying the foundation through the Mulch Museum and Stop the Hate program so that people of all walks of life can build connections. 14 years ago, Stop the Hate started out as an essay writing contest. Shortly after, we added a songwriting contest, which we call Youth Speak Out and Youth Sing Out. Both celebrate Northeast Ohio students in sixth to 12th grade who are committed to creating a more accepting, inclusive society by standing up and speaking out against bias and bigotry as they compete for the chance to win prestigious awards. Stop the Hate is more than a competition. It's a learning journey, engaging youth through in-person and online tours and exhibitions. We are continuing to evolve with our partners Lake Erie Inc. and Roots of American Music. We are bringing Stop the Hate workshops into classrooms across Northeast Ohio, allowing more touch points with students every year. Since program inception, we have had over 40,000 student touch points across 12 counties in Northeast Ohio. And as of this year, we will have invested $1.4 million in scholarships, prizes, and grants to students, teachers, and schools. Rooted in the Jewish value of respect for all humanity, the Maltz Museum is proud that it continues to give young people of all faiths and backgrounds a platform to speak out in support of inclusion and diversity. This is all made possible through the generous support of our sponsors. Thank you to our Stop the Hate presenting sponsors, the Semi J and Ruth Begun Foundation, and Dworkin and Bernstein, a full service law firm. And thank you to our Youth Sing Out and Youth Speak Out signature sponsors Callahan Foundation, Chelm Family Foundation, Dealer Tire, Dominion Energy, Harry Kay and Emma R. Fox Charitable Foundation, the Lubrizol Foundation, Martha Holden Jennings Foundation. Nordson Corporation Foundation, Saltzman Youth Panel of the Jewish Federation of Cleveland, and the Helen F. Stolyer and Louis Stolyer Family Foundation. Thank you for your generosity. And we would like to recognize our incredible community partners. We might work for different organizations, but we are all in this together. Thank you for your partnership. To my fellow board members and the Stop the Hate Committee, I would like to thank you for your continued support of the Stop the Hate program and to the staff for your flawless execution year after year. To get here is no easy task. We receive thousands of essays and songwriting submissions from middle and high schoolers. Each student entry is read and scored three times by our team of 400 volunteer readers. Then the highest scoring are read again by a select group of Stop the Hate judges to determine who will be the winners tonight. We asked students to think about the words of Cambodian-born human rights activist, author, and Cleveland resident Luang Ung, who famously said, courage is when you dare to be yourself in whatever ways you want to be, to not be afraid, to just do it. Throughout the evening, we will hear from our top 10 courageous 11th and 12th grade students who are vying for a $20,000 scholarship. And you can ask them questions at the live Q&A session with the Stop the Hate Vice Chair, Scott Simon, following the big reveal. Just write your questions in the chat. He's monitoring behind the scenes. And now let's get started by hearing from one of our top 10, a 12th grader from Hudson High School. This is Janan Karakish. From the death of three Muslim students, to Trump's travel ban, to a Muslim family who got run over by a truck driver, to Macron's hateful speech, two, 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 it would take years to go through every Islamophobic incident, 
from Ohio to Illinois to Nebraska to Utah to Texas to New York, even France, Canada, and India. Islamophobic incidents flood worldwide. The Muslim world watches with an aching, bleeding heart. And me? I feel despair, bitterness, and every other word for heartbroken. Witnessing the world's malevolence toward Muslims, a threat strikes me as I leave my home. My mom's cautious voice rings in my ear. Negative thoughts live deep within my head. Wherever I go, I face stares that are filled with discontentment as if people want to say, you're a terrorist or oppressed. The staring chokes me. Then I eavesdrop as my ears detect the vibrations of intimidating laughter. My hijab reveals my religion. When I wore the hijab, I was taught to be appreciative and proud. However, the painful, intolerable feelings lag behind. The insecurity was not enough, and a first-hand account of an Islamophobic incident had to happen. My family and I were in the car when we saw an old man in his pickup approaching. I could see the disgust in his eyes, but I was used to this nonverbal cue. He turned slowly from the other side of the road, honked, and said, Take off that hat, you! And he roamed off, howling a dozen offensive and foul-mouthed language. I had an abrupt feeling of a knife stabbing my heart. Undoubtedly, I realized that that old man was suffering from bigotry. From my bitter experience, I learned that all Muslims will face harassment, death, or be subject to prejudice until the ice is broken. I had a responsibility to educate others about the separation between religion and inhumanity. And this is what I would say. Is it reasonable that 1.8 billion people are terrorists? That the second largest religion is home to barbarous people? No. Still, you might be asking, how would you explain those Islamic extremist groups? I would answer with a verse from the Holy Quran. Whoever kills an innocent person, it is as if they killed all of humanity. I take advantage of every opportunity to spread the word of Islam, whether it's through essays, volunteerism, or serving on committees. At my school, I serve on the Cultural Proficiency Advisory Committee to adopt a diverse environment. Through this committee, I not only spread awareness about Islamophobia, but I also promote Black and Women's History Months. Currently, I want to establish an interfaith prayer room to appreciate all cultures, religions, and traditions. Unquestionably, I won't stop there. And until my last breath, I will prove to people that Islam encourages kindness, love, forgiveness, and most importantly, peace. What's better proof than the fact that Muslims greet one another with the phrase, Assalamu alaikum, or peace be upon you. It takes an incredible amount of courage to share stories that are so personal. And I think these kids are so brave, All right? Who's up next? Let's hear from McKenna Roy, a 12th grader from Mayfield High School. Yes, I'm deaf, and so is my sister, my father, and my aunt too. It runs in the family. Then my teacher told me, how sad, I'm so sorry to hear that. Sad? I never thought of our deafness as something sad. I grew up in a household where American Sign Language was used more often than spoken English. My hearing mother has a career as a sign language interpreter, and she absolutely loves her job. My family attends deaf socials so we can meet other people with a hearing loss, and I've never had a sad time. When I think of deaf culture and what it means to have a hearing loss, I've always seen it as something beautiful and worth celebrating, but I learned that not everyone felt the same way. I soon realized that this was also true for many other people out there with different kinds of disabilities. People tend to think that if someone has a disability, it's something sad and it requires fixing. This infuriated me because I grew up surrounded by people with disabilities, both at home and at school, and we never treated each other any differently. Wheelchairs, prosthetic limbs, hearing aids, you name it, nothing ever slowed us down. Then I asked myself, how can I change the way people think? I wish there was a simple solution. Breaking down years of systemic oppression and stigmatization is no easy task, but it's not impossible. Change starts with just one person, and we must gather the courage to take the first step. For me, I started by creating simulations of certain disabilities so that other people could understand how it felt to live with one. 
I showed my able-bodied peers what it meant to have a disability and the adaptations that people use in their day-to-day -day lives, like me with my hearing aids. I also spent 24 hours in a wheelchair so that I could personally understand the challenges that come with being unable to walk and to advocate for the changes and accommodations that could be made in my school. I even inspired my classmates to do the same thing so that we could better understand different people's perspectives and adapt to them together. We have made a difference in our community by bridging the gap between those with and without disabilities. I believe that if we listen to and educate others on our unique life experiences, we can grow closer to understanding and empathizing with each other and making significant societal changes. I aim to pursue a career in the medical profession so that I can work with kids like me who have disabilities and help them get a proper head start in life. I want people to be proud of who they are and to have the courage to live authentically because being different is nothing to be ashamed of or sad about. That's what I told my teacher back then and that's what I'll continue to tell people now. Tonight, we will also want to celebrate the schools who participated in Stop to Hate workshops or who used our Stop to Hate curriculum in their classrooms this year. We offered Stop to Hate workshops at no cost to schools. 32 schools across Northeast Ohio from Cleveland to Canton welcomed us into their classrooms. These schools are sharing $30,000 in funds allocated to support their continued learning journey. That means each of these schools is receiving a $900 anti-bias education grant in the year ahead. Last year with their anti-bias grants, Collingwood High School created a book club for students and educators, purchasing books on anti-racism, LBGTQ plus issues, and body positivity. And Citizens Leadership Academy sent two teachers to a Teaching Toward Equity seminar as part of their professional development. Congratulations, and thank you for committing your schools to the essential work of anti-bias education. We can't wait to hear what exciting new projects you'll start. Now let's take a moment to hear from another one of our finalists, Sama Khan, an 11th grader at Beechwood High School. You, a neurosurgeon? I'd pulled the plug before I'd let a girl operate on me. The conversation fell silent as I looked over my shoulder to see the boy grinning to himself. Tears itched their way into my eyes as I pretended to ignore him, but I knew that this was the first of many deterrents I would face on my journey as a female entering a male-dominated workplace. Daring to be oneself in an environment that sets standards based solely on gender is a formidable undertaking. Courage is birthed from confidence, but women are disallowed from taking pride in themselves for anything less than perfection. I have seen female classmates purposefully leaving assignments unfinished to avoid dealing with the prospect of producing something that isn't flawless. Working towards acceptance in surroundings that promote this kind of self-sabotage is nearing impossible with every passing day. My parents have been nothing but nurturing towards my aspirations in life, but the looming inevitability of stepping out into the workforce alone was dawning on me. Soon, I'd climb up the corporate ladder only to be met with the glass ceiling streaked with the fingerprints of so many potential leaders. But I was determined to change that. Today, I am one of several international ambassadors for a worldwide organization dedicated to the advancement of females in STEM fields. Representing women in STEM by leading a group of students towards projects that make a change is extremely empowering, and we've only just begun. Our local chapter is currently collaborating with the student government to create a gender parity goal for the 2025 to 2026 academic year, where we anticipate seeing increased female involvement in male-dominated advanced STEM classes at my high school. Instilling young women with the confidence with which men have been inculcated since birth can have hugely advantageous results, which is why recruitment is so important to us. Courage is something that I have worked towards and I'm still reaching for today. I am now spearheading multiple school-wide projects for raising awareness of gender disparity in STEM. In a further attempt to build a legacy, I am also currently executive president-elect of our student council for the next academic year. Yet even still, my mind echoes with the ever-present question, am I doing enough? 
The answer, I learned, is simple. Worth cannot be singularly defined, not by gender, race, socioeconomic status, or anything for that matter. Something that discrimination inadvertently helped me realize is that my abilities as a professional will never be reduced to my gender. My career ambitions have shifted, naturally, with time and exploration of other interests, but not at all because of the disparaging remarks I received and continue to receive from ill-wishers. The road I construct for myself will never be a straight line, but I've come to terms with the turns. My devotion to medicine and dedication to female advancement are fused in perpetuity, a fusion from which no one could ever pull the plug. And now we like to announce the 6th through 10th grade essay contest winners. Each second place winner will receive a $100 cash prize, and each first place winner will receive a cash prize of $400. Our second place winners are, in sixth grade, Matia Sturman from Rocky River Middle School. In seventh grade, Anshil Nassar from Hathaway Brown. In eighth grade, Chelsea Gibson from Monticello Middle School. In ninth grade, Ana Khan from Beechwood High School. And in 10th grade, Asia Howard from Twinsburg High School. Congratulations. And our first place winners are, in sixth grade, Juliet Richard from Hudson Middle School. In seventh grade, Jocelyn Sesnowitz from the Joseph and Florence Mandel Jewish Day School. In eighth grade, Ida Chang from Beechwood Middle School. And in ninth grade, Michael McNally from Mayfield High School. And in 10th grade, Benjamin Ralph from Walsh Jesuit High School. Congratulations to these outstanding students. You can find each of these students' essays on our Stop the Hate Learning portal, and I encourage you to read them all. Now it's time to hear from another one of our finalists, Moira Ackerman, a 12th grader at Hudson High School. You're such a downy. My head whipped around so fast. Staring him down, I said, you know, my sister has Down syndrome. The laughter stopped and his mouth shut. People with disabilities are constantly harassed, both to their faces and behind their backs. The bus is just one of the places that I've witnessed having a disability made into an insult. The saddest part is, sometimes a person who has a disability doesn't even know that they are being bullied. They look up to their typical peers with such adoration, yet are treated with such disdain. My oldest sister would come home from school every day telling us stories of her friends at school. She would call them my lunch squad boys or my super fan boys. She idolized these kids and they probably were annoyed with her. I never got to see how they would talk about her when she wasn't around. But based on how the people in my school treat individuals with disabilities, I could only assume that they didn't love her as much as she did them. It's not just the students though. The whole school treats people with disabilities with inferiority. All the special education classes are in the basement of the school, isolated from the hustle and bustle of all the students through the halls. At the end of the day, when I would trudge down the staircase to pick up my sister to walk home, I would feel as if I left the school entirely. It would be so quiet. Just the faint instruction from teachers could be heard. The problem is the typical students don't interact with students with disabilities. They don't realize these students have feelings and are very kind people who care about everyone. I have constantly tried to protect individuals with disabilities because it's in my genes. Whenever I hear a disrespectful comment about or directed at a person with a disability, I never fail to stick up for them. Since middle school, I started volunteering for programs for those with disabilities, such as Buddy Up Tennis, which teaches individuals with Downs how to play. Additionally, my school has started to implement a more accepting environment by creating clubs within the school for students with disabilities that pair typically developing students with peers with needs like Our Time to Shine. Through this program, I've assisted my peers with disabilities put on a play and learn their lines, as well as encouraging friends to join programs within our school, such as Sparkle Cheerleading, for those with disabilities to cheer at sports games. This summer, I will be doing a week-long camp for people with Down syndrome. The campers have the most fun because the volunteers care. I think the only way for this group of people to not be discriminated against is for people to spend time and get to know those wonderful human beings. The best way to spread love is to get involved and be kind. It's time to announce the middle school winners of the Stop the Hate songwriting contest. 
In second place, receiving a $2,000 anti-bias education grant is Molly Lockwood's sixth grade class from Clark Elementary School. They wrote the song, Revenge Is Not The Way, led by teaching artist Sam Cooper. Revenge is not the way, it doesn't get you anywhere. If it's your love every day, nothing else can compare. And congratulations to our first place winner, receiving a $3,500 anti-bias education grant, Lisa Blasco's seventh grade class from Garfield Middle School. They wrote the song, Tell Me My Life Matters, with teaching artist Charlie Mossbrook. We are all human and I need to know my life matters to you. Tell me black lives matter. Now say it again. Congratulations to both classes. Now we're going to hear from Rachel Davis, a 12th grader at Hudson High School. I stood in the bathroom in silent agony, my heart breaking into pieces. The N-word had been screamed in my presence, and I became the brunt of laughter. When attempting to leave, I discovered I was being kept inside of the bathroom. Being one of the 1% of Black students in my predominantly white school, I felt alone. After I pushed my way out of the bathroom, the girls laughed even more. Stumbling down the hall, bent over from the joke I must have missed. The joke was me. I waited until they left to let my tears fall. This Band-Aid had been ripped off too many times. I went to the bathroom for my sophomore geometry class, where I was the only black student, and I didn't want to return. I hated standing out. I was a stamp on a white envelope. After talking to the principal, I felt as though I'd been kicked in the gut. The office was a dreary place for me, and many staff members felt I misunderstood many things. The principal disregarded my claims, saying the offenders were good kids. When I arrived home, my twin confronted one of the girls on social media and told her to not have contact until she apologized. Her response, okay, N-word, go get lynched in my plantation. What are you gonna do about it, N-word? My siblings and I stood in disbelief. My older sister took a screenshot. Later that evening, my older sister made a post. The school immediately sent out announcements. As soon as the media knew, the school took action. They scrambled to cover up details, but it was too late. Many demanded change and would not allow injustice to continue. Looking back, my suffering was not in vain. Students and staff were forced to face what goes on in our high school. My school set up seminars, bringing awareness to the importance of acceptance, discussing how some actions were wrong and why. For example, many people laugh at racial jokes and say racist comments at school, while they are surrounded by people who have never experienced racial injustice or discrimination. This is common. Now I never leave a racial situation without questions and teachings. What you said was offensive because, that was hurtful because, I am not here to put up with racism, but to give everyone an opportunity to grow and have a second chance. Many times when people acknowledge they are wrong and receive forgiveness, they do everything they can to make the situation better and continue forward. Knowledge and acknowledgement is healing. I certainly can't get that response every time, but even if people stay the way they are, others can affect their decisions. People do what others allow them to do. I have grown as an individual. My experiences in life have contributed to the person I am because no matter what I do, I love being me and I'm happy to stand and make a difference. It's time to announce the high school winners of the Stop the Hate Songwriting Contest. In second place, receiving a $2,000 anti-bias education grant is Sarah Hodges Civics 2.0 class from Glenville High School with the song Skittles, led by teaching artist Charlie Mossbrook. And all I got is Skittles, but I need better fiddles. If we want to calm the anger, we need to solve this riddle. And in first place, Nicole Majorcak's first period class from Beachwood High School wins a $3,500 anti-bias education grant for their song, Speak Out, led by teaching artist Taylor Lamborn. Speak out, speak now. Thanks to all the schools who participated in our sing-out. 
You can listen to every class song online in our Stop the Hate Learning portal. Let's turn now to Tiba Drake, a 12th grade student at Rhodes College and Career Academy. Can you imagine getting punished for refusing to let your husband film the private moments of your marriage? For her refusal, my mother got an ashtray thrown in her face. There was nothing she could do about it because we were women in Iraq. When I lived in Iraq, I thought abuse was normal. I witnessed and experienced Iraqi men normalizing abuse of their wives. The women were trapped and hopeless. Trust me, fighting back wasn't an option. School wasn't an option. Choosing your own husband wasn't an option. Sometimes even leaving the house wasn't even an option. This ideology drove my mother to the brink of suicide. Somehow she managed to survive for the sake of her children. On the day my stepfather put his hands on me, my mother snapped. She used a neighbor's cell phone to call the authorities. We were asked to give witness statements. I was nervous, but my mother's courage filled me. I put my fears aside and told them everything. This was my first strike against hate, but it wouldn't be my last. We came to America. Here, life was both better and worse. I could go to school, but experienced bullying because of my ethnicity. People called me a terrorist. I couldn't respond because I wasn't fluent in English. Sometimes they would even make bombing jokes. At other times, they'd mock my dark hair and skin. None of this fazed me much. After all, I had faced so much worse. I knew what it was like being a woman from a different country. I knew what it was like to be treated as a second-class citizen. I had been through enough to be grateful for the new avenues open to me. As time went on, I grew more comfortable speaking English. On the day I was able to speak up for another immigrant in my school, I knew I was an American woman, a woman of conviction who would stand up for others a woman who would go to college, a woman who would study medicine to help other women in situations as my mother had faced. We all owe our lives to our mothers. In my case, this is a double debt. My mother risked her life to get me out of Iraq. I owe it to her to help women in seemingly impossible situations. From her, I learned having courage can change your future. From her, I learned how to strike back against hatred. In her name, I will continue to stop hate by making sure women get the help they need in their most extreme circumstances. My plan is to become a trauma nurse, specializing in cases of rape and spousal abuse. It's a hard path for me to choose. I've battled my own darkness four years. I know I'll face triggering events in my future career. I know it's our duty to fight demons for others once we've conquered our own. It's a battle I believe I can win. Dahlia, now it's time to recognize our teachers. Oh, well, you know, there's one very important teacher at our museum, and that is our very own Courtney Krieger. We are proud to share exciting news with you. Please welcome Tamara Blair of Newton D. Baker School of Arts, one of our 2021 Teachers of the Year. Thank you, Courtney. When I was recognized as Teacher of the Year last year, it was just an extension of the pride I feel for our school and their participation in this amazing program. I'm very excited to be part of recognizing two new honorees this year. As teachers, we work very hard, mostly in the background, to create learning experiences that will motivate and challenge our students. Vicki and Nicole, you are being honored by the Stop the Hate program because you do that kind of work. We want to thank you for providing Northeast Ohio students a platform to stand up and speak out against hate, 
through the Stop the Hate program. You have been selected as the 2022 Stop the Hate Educators of the Year. Congratulations. Let's hear those students cheer. Thank you so much. Good job. Thank you. Not only have you earned a prestigious title, but you'll also receive a $1,000 cash prize of your personal use, for your personal use. Thank you. I would like to introduce you to the editor of Northeast Ohio Parent Magazine, Angela Gartner. Why is it important, like right now, to teach this anti-bias education to students? I teach an English class, but I teach people. You know, I teach humans that are going to, you know, grow up to be the people who influence our world. So to understand that like bias still exists and what we can do each individually, rather than feeling overwhelmed or hopeless, which I think sometimes it's easy for kids to feel like, well, I'm just one teenage person and nobody wants to listen to me. Um, I think making them feel honored, like you have a voice and this is what you can do, you're one small part, and then working together like this creates, that's what creates change in the world, it's the only way. Have you guys seen an impact to your school and to your classroom since teaching the program? I do think it makes a difference, especially um, with their um, camaraderie with each other, just kind of, you know, the way that they treat each other. They, they write about this, they sing about it, and then they hear each other's stories, and they are able to, they do share their stories with each other as much as they're comfortable with um, with some of the, the writing process with the peer review. Um, and I think it, you know, really encourages empathy. Thank you for all you do, Nicole and Vicki. Next up, let me introduce you to our next finalist, Lizzie Hoang, our 11th grader at Shaker Heights High School. My blood boiled as the news coverage of an Asian grandmother punched in the face in San Francisco replayed in my head like a broken record. My heart was downtrodden as I solemnly cataloged this event among one of many injustices committed against Asian Americans during the months of the pandemic. Reading constantly about the brutal murders of innocent Asian Americans scapegoated for the worldwide pandemic the growing antagonistic feelings toward my community planted the seed of worthlessness into my heart. An integral part of my identity was repeatedly being assaulted, isolated, and caged all over the big screen TVs in the country that I was supposed to feel free in. I was slowly starting to learn the true extent of inhumanity. As an Asian American armed with just a violin and a passion for music during a time of worldwide hibernation, I decided to try to prove with conviction and compassion that instead of berating and belittling others just because of their ethnicity, it was time to show love and empathy towards each other. This pandemic was a ruthless beast larger than humanity, grasping at any hint of vitality regardless of race, culture, and background. So. With the help of my friends, I organized and virtually produced two covers of classical music pieces, The Swan by Camille Saint-Saëns and Meditation from Taï by Jewel Messonnet. I compiled all of our individual playing, overlaid it with media depicting acts of kindness during the pandemic, and dedicated it to the COVID-19 relief effort sending it into local hospitals like the Cleveland Clinic and university hospitals and broadcasting it within our school. I also collaborated with my two sisters and our friend to produce a holiday album and posted it on social media in order to spread warmth and positivity during the height of the pandemic. As life is slowly starting to return back to normal, I'm hoping to reach out and dedicate more of my efforts to subduing both outward violence and microaggressions toward my community by becoming more active online and using music to continue to bridge that divide between prejudice and harmony. Unfortunately, fighting racism is a never-ending battle. There is still so much work to be done. Recently, I was incredibly disheartened to hear of disgusting comments made toward my nine-year-old sister at her school, in a community in which we trusted to be kind and loving to our children. One student had told her that they hated Chinese people for the virus, and another was mocking karate and yelling ching chong to her face. How much longer must Asian Americans continue to endure this hatred? 
How much longer must we corrupt the minds of our innocent children who will learn to prey on others just because of the color of their skin? We all lived through the terrors of the pandemic where pain had come in all forms. It's only in these desperate times must we learn to empower each other with empathy and compassion. We have heard from seven incredible high school students so far tonight. Congratulations to Janan, Lizzie, Moira, McKenna, Rachel, Sama, and Tiba. I'm so pleased to announce that they'll each be receiving a $1,000 prize as our honorable mention finalists. Each of your schools will receive $500 towards anti-bias education in the year ahead. We thank you for sharing your passion for justice with us. Congratulations to you all. But the night's not over yet. There are three remaining finalists competing for the grand prize of $20,000. In no particular order, Jacqueline Hudak, 11th grader from Lakewood High School. Fluorescent lights shone down on us. Shadows of petrified girls cast on the gym floor. Sweat dripped from the forehead of every female athlete as we lined up on the baseline. It was a moment of uniting and separating fear. If you're over 5'6 and under 150 pounds, step forward. Everyone else, look at the girls that I will pick for the varsity volleyball team. I was astonished. The newly hired volleyball coach had no idea that the players left on the baseline had more skill than half the people he called forward. Still, those unselected girls were so traumatized from the body shaming that they were reduced to that they never came back to another open gym, practice, or tryout. The reoccurring body shaming of female athletes in sports leads to a lifetime of harmful self-deprecation. The cycle needs to be stopped for young girls to have self-confidence and to express gratitude. That experience changed my life. It sparked my passion to advocate for body positivity, and most importantly, to educate young girls that they should feel nothing but love and gratitude for themselves. Love is the opposite of hate, and gratitude is the catalyst of change to stop that hate. My vocation is for young girls to be thankful for all the jobs their bodies do for them, for girls to be as kind to themselves as they are to others. After the discrimination I experienced, I took action to have the coach removed. We met with the principals, athletic director, parents, and traumatized athletes to have the coach step down. I participated in a town hall meeting, making myself vulnerable to the public, coach, and administration to tell my story, the story of every female athlete in the volleyball program, the story of how we were subjected to a value system based on the way we looked. I've continued to promote self-acceptance and body positivity by being an active member of Race and Diversity Club at my school a program that tackles multiple social issues school-wide. I also plan to help with the local Girls on the Run program that introduces elementary age girls to fitness in a supportive and welcoming environment. The program is led by an all-female staff and continues to help girls feel confident with themselves. I will not stop advocating for the importance of positivity, especially with young girls. My career goal is to be a doctor. I want to defy industry norms and demonstrate to other young girls that being confident and grateful can lead to great success. I know that there will always be those who try to put us down because of the way we look. Race, gender, size, ethnicity, sexuality. Nevertheless, it's our job to break the glass ceiling. Discrimination has plagued society for hundreds of years, and it comes from the disease of misinformation and a lack of education. It takes all of us uniting not in fear, but in hope to stop the hate. Sanjana Katiar an 11th grader from Strongsville High School. Why is something that 1.8 billion individuals around the world experience so stigmatized? Why must we create code words for something that is natural? Why is it shamed upon to discuss normal and healthy topics about our evolving bodies? These are questions I ask myself every day. As a woman, I am ashamed by the way society has shaped the conversation around menstruation. The stigma continues to be infiltrated into innocent minds even in the 21st century. Even today, young women grow up thinking they have to conceal what their bodies are going through naturally instead of embracing it. The media has negatively influenced menstruators to refer to it as shark week or that time of the month, rather than accepting it for what it is and not being afraid to call it a period. Looking back to when I was educated about periods in school, Boys and girls were separated. Why? Females are not the only individuals that should be knowledgeable about menstruation. 
Why discriminate against who is or isn't included in this conversation? Wouldn't having an open conversation cultivate a healthy attitude about menstruation and set an environment where other topics can be discussed openly and candidly? The simple act of sending girls to one room and boys to another is where the stigma of menstruation is seated in children's minds. Doesn't sitting in a room full of the same gender kids already make it feel like a taboo topic? Now, as a high schooler, when I walk into my school bathroom, my eyes are always drawn towards the silver rectangular box hanging on the far end of the wall that has 25 cents imprinted on it. Inside that box are menstrual products. What if you don't have a quarter? What if you feel too embarrassed to ask for a product because of the way society has characterized periods? Wouldn't it be comforting to know that should you ever need a menstrual product, it is readily available, not just in my school, but everywhere? My passion for this social cause has led me to become the co-president of the Northeast Ohio Period Chapter, a youth-led menstrual movement. The three pillars of our chapter stand for advocacy, education, and service. Our goal is to reduce the stigma surrounding menstruation, advocate for a more thoughtful education process, and provide free menstrual products for our community. I organized a school-wide menstrual product drive, which was an immense success. In total, we collected 881 menstrual products that were donated to a local woman's shelter for battered women. I was elated to see the support received from my school community. My next goal for the chapter is to provide free menstrual products at my school and eventually expand to other school districts. With continued education and open dialogue, my hope is to change the way periods are viewed by society and provide free access to these products. I plan to major in psychology and specialize in women's reproductive health during medical school. And our last finalist, Marasia Moss, 12th grader from Jackson High School. When I was 12 years old, I was oblivious to how the outside world's problems still surface from the 16th century. One bus ride forever scarred my life. On the bus, I was talking to my friend about the upcoming football game and we were coordinating our outfits. Suddenly, I felt a thick rope around my neck slowly becoming tighter each second. I began gasping for air. The background noise was filled with laughter from my peers. In those seconds, I thought about how this moment could not be the end of my story. A tear slowly ran down my cheek. Finally, the rope loosened and I was in disbelief. For the rest of the bus ride, I sat in silence. I immediately went home and told my dad, each sentence pausing, trying not to shed another tear. Towards the end of the conversation, I asked him, why me? At a young age, I was forced to realize the world was cruel to an African-American girl in the 21st century. In the midst of my situation, I attempted to reach out. I reached out to administrators who turned a blind eye to the situation. I reached out to my counselor who tried to sugarcoat the bus ride. Lastly, I reached out to the Ohio Civil Rights Department, which took six years to reach back out. I felt isolated. After this experience, I learned to process my confusion, loneliness, and hatred. After processing this experience, I wanted to ensure this did not happen to another African-American girl, boy, or anyone else. I wanted to stop the hate through activism. As an activist for racial equality, I joined a women-led diversity group. I was relieved when I realized young women my age encountered these same cruel experiences. While I wouldn't wish this type of trauma upon anyone else, finding a sense of community made me feel less isolated. Slowly, after each meeting, the feeling of isolation began to disappear. Reflecting on that one bus ride, I knew my school needed social justice reform. Within my school, I founded a poetry club in hopes of providing an outlet that fostered creativity, allowing students like myself to embrace social injustices. Writing poems helped me expose the truth and taught me the importance of authenticity. Lastly, I founded a nonprofit organization sending young children inspirational letters and care packages to children in different communities, locally, nationally, and globally. These experiences not only showed me how to redirect my anger, but how to grow from my atrocities. Hate has penetrated our society for many years. However, it is our response to hate that holds significant weight. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, 
Only love can do that. Jacqueline, Sanjana, and Raja, you're now a very special part of the Stop the Hate legacy, and you should be very proud of what you have already accomplished. But there can only be one grand prize winner. Our second runner-up and the winner of a $5,000 scholarship and a $2,000 grant for their school is Sanjana Katiar from Strongsville High School. Our first runner-up and winner of a $10,000 scholarship and a $2,000 grant for their school is Mareja Moss from Jackson High School. Our grand prize winner and recipient of a $20,000 scholarship with a $5,000 grant to their school from Lakewood High School, ladies and gentlemen, Jacqueline Kudak. We're lucky to have young leaders like you here in Northeast Ohio. Congratulations to all. This isn't the last you'll hear of our incredible finalists. On Monday, April 18th, tune in live for Sound of Ideas on 89.7 WKSU or 104.9 WCPN. Then on Thursday, May 12th, join us at the City Club of Cleveland for a special youth forum. And on Saturday, June 18th, join us in commemorating Juneteenth with the NAACP of Lake County. More events will be announced soon at www.maltzmuseum.org. Visit our website and find out more. But for now, stay with us as we go live with Scott and our top 10 juniors and seniors for Q&A. Here we go. Good evening, everybody. Hi there. Um, so nice to see all of you. Um, and good evening to everybody that has joined us tonight. Um, sorry that I was behind for a couple seconds, but my name is Scott Simon. I'm vice chair of the Stop the Hate Committee and with our chair, Daryl McNair and the whole Maltz Museum team, thank you to all of you for being with us for this very, very special evening tonight. And of course, I wanna welcome and uh, really thank um, the Maltz's um, commitment to uh, this project, this contest, and uh, their vision has uh, shown through for so many years. They have given these students a platform to share their experiences for standing up and speaking out against hate, and we thank them so much. And I know you're excited, and I am too, to learn about our top 10. I hope that you'll stay with us for the next half an hour. So let's bring them to the virtual stage. Hopefully you can see all of them and I'm gonna do the same. Hi everybody, congratulations. It's nice to see all of you. Um, just a, a quick word to everybody watching tonight. Um, we can't hear you, but we certainly can get your chat. So please uh, send any questions, any congratulations uh, to the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We've already seen a number and then I will uh, if we have time at the end, I will ask some questions after we hear from some of these, actually all of these unbelievable people. Um, so to all of you students, I wanna just say how incredibly proud we are of you. You've showed courage, you've shown resolve, and most importantly, you took action. In a world that feels sometimes paralyzed by hate and fear, you took action. And in the end, you have inspired all of us. So we'll get a chance to hear how you're thinking and how you're feeling. Um, but first, I would like to uh, call upon our grand prize winner, Jacqueline. And I would just like to open up by asking you, how do you feel? Hi, thank you. I'm very shocked. Obviously, everyone had a great story. And earlier, when we all got together to hear everyone's, I was just blown away by everyone's essays and I'm really happy, yeah. Did you have any feeling when you were writing this that this might have this level of impact? Um, what was in your mind when you finally hit send on that email or you turned it in? How did you feel? Um, honestly, I was uh, proud of the work I put in. I, actually, my whole class submitted. So, and uh, there's a shout out to my English teacher, Mrs. Garitano, for pushing me to do it. And I finally submitted it. I was like, we'll see what happened. I had, I had no expectations. So I'm really, I'm really grateful. Well, we are very grateful for you. So thank you so much for 
your participation and congratulations again. And I know we'll hear a little bit more from you tonight as we go through these questions. Um, but I want to um, just bring up an issue that was a theme in a number of the essays, and that is the issue of racism. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for those of you who chose to dedicate your essays to this topic, um, and I'm thinking mainly of Lizzie and Marasia and Rachel, um, you know, could you tell us um, what gives you hope about the future of our community, race relations in our community? Um, feel free to either raise your hand or, or jump in any of the three of you. You wrote so and spoke so beautifully. What is your thought about the future of race relations in our city? Um, Lizzie, oh, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, Great. So I, um, I really hope that more people can um, speak up about it and be brave about it and um, not be afraid to be vulnerable. I think... Um, like, I think what was so important to me um, that I wanted to touch on in my essay is like um, finding these communities, like forging these connections, finding inspiration through other means, um, other mediums, whether it be like music or sports, I use music or like art or writing. And these kinds of things promote like cooperation and compassion. And I think through these communities that we kind of make and forge, we can integrate people and you know art knows no bounds like writing knows no limits there's no sort of you can enter you can exit kind of thing and so through these nests through these interests it's really important to me to be able to bridge these divides and there's so many there's so many amazing like prolific talents out there they're all over the internet and it just warms my heart when I go on social media and I see these kinds of communities like music making communities and people sharing their art and these kinds of things bring people together so there really is no space for that there's no there's no place for that kind of hate you know and I think that's what's the most important thing but your your project was so stunning and um the, you can just feel the positivity radiating out of you uh, so thank you for your words tonight and thank you for the project that you put out into the world and I'm sure that you will continue to do that. Um, Marasia, do you wanna tell us a little bit about kind of your thoughts of where things stand right now and what are your hopes? Yeah, of course. I would like to go alongside what Lizzie said. I think hope comes from friends, organizations such as um, Stop the Hate and people who stand in opposition of racism. I believe that like our country has done so much so far and we're still making progress to meet those terms of hope. Days like today put us like one step further and closer to that end goal. And I would just like to end with like a little quote from like Rosa Parks and then in the words of Rosa Parks, you never must be fearful of what you're doing when it is right. So I just think that hope is very important, especially when um, problems occur and that people just need to look at the greater good of everything and just continue to reach out to communities like these and organiza organizations like these. Thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. Man, you guys are so impressive. Um, I know that you're probably hearing that from a lot of people around you, but um, it, is, uh, it is just touching all of us. Um, I, uh, Rachelle, would you give us your thoughts? I think that, I think now in society right now, I think we stand in a good place because even if somebody does anything wrong, a lot of people stand up and oppose it or stop it in its tracks, whatever it may be. Because for example, with a lot of, a lot of the essays, like they discussed a problem, but then they also discussed like other people or themselves standing up against, against it. And I think that's beneficial because I mean, people do what you allow them to do. For sure. Oh, thank you very much. That was that was really um, that's it's 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 brilliant um, and powerful. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I want to um, uh, uh, pivot just a little bit um, and talk about another thing that came out tonight, and that was um, talk about ableism and the experiences of the disabled community. And in that, I'm thinking a little bit of Moira and McKenna. Um, and so I'd like to um, send this question to, to the two of you. Um, and that is, what is one change that you would like to see happen in Cleveland 
that would create greater access to people with disabilities. Moira, do you wanna kick us off? Um, yeah, I think one change would be more involvement between individuals with disabilities and their typical peers. Like, um, I believe like more integrated classrooms could be a start instead of allowing separation between the um, special education classrooms and um, the typical classrooms. I think interaction um, with those different than us is super important and also diversifying like job positions, um, allowing developly mentally challenged individuals to have more jobs in the community. Um, in my town, there used to be a cafe that hired all individuals with disabilities yeah. and a program like that enables employment and would benefit those inv individuals aging out of the school system and also engage citizens in the community to continue to develop um, relationships with those employed with disabilities. And I think that'd be really powerful to have interactions in all type of aspects to allow more um, like compassion for people different than us. Thank you so much. All right, McKenna, what are your thoughts? So I totally agree with Laura on this because I think that there's a negative stereotype that surrounds people with disabilities where we're also accustomed to our own lives that it's ingrained within ourselves to just overlook people of different abilities. And so I would also like to see further change in our education systems where we can incorporate disability education in like our social studies classes or our health classes. Um, because looking back, I wasn't taught about different kinds of disabilities. I had to go out and research and figure out what these things were because it was happening all around me and I didn't know what it was, but nobody ever told me. So I think that it's important to educate our youth on our differences, whether it be physical, mental, or even superficial, because with simple education, people can understand each other better, and, and that would lead to less prejudice, because when we separate our children from their peers with disabilities, what does that teach them? It teaches them that it's okay to just not include anyone, so we can't keep ingraining this idea of separation in our classrooms, because that leads to a divided world. So change starts with our youth and we can start now. <laughs> um, it, I, I know that these answers are, are off the cuff and, and thoughts that you're all having in the moment, but I, I feel like you could have winning essays just by the answers that you're giving in this Q&A tonight. You guys are, are really um, so incredibly impressive. Um, okay, I'm gonna um, switch um, topics a little bit again. Um, and some of our um, viewers would like to uh, hear a little bit more about the subject of gender-based discrimination. Um, so um, I'd like to address this to uh, Jacqueline and Sama and Sanjana and Tiba um, to, um, if you want to address the issue and if you want to, if you want to kind of play off of this a little bit, that's fine. But what advice or encouragement do you think girls and young women need to hear in 2022? So should we, Jacqueline, do you wanna start us off? Sure. Um, for what advice I think that people should hear, probably just that um, you know, other people's success is not your failure. I think a lot of times, especially with females, it, it can be competitive, but there's enough space and the world is big enough where, you know, you can lift as you rise and there, you know, looking at even all the um, essays today, it was a all female finish. So I think a lot of times the future is female and uh, help each other out, you know, don't uh, push each other down. Well said, I couldn't agree. And not as a female, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think you're absolutely right. And it is a, an all female finish. Um, Sama, would you uh, give us your thoughts? Um, in terms of advice, I want to say that the most important thing that I have learned and continue to employ in my everyday life is that there is truly strength in numbers. And no matter how much pressure you feel to do so, you cannot do it alone. Many hands truly do make light work, and in union there is truly an unseen power. The piece of advice that I will forever give is that you find your people and you stick with them. 
and it's truly worked for me and it's going to work for everybody. I promise. <laughs> That's great. Well, I hope you will include us in your people after tonight where you have a lot of, you have hundreds of people that are now your people. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and Sanjana, can you give us your thoughts? Of course. So regarding advice, I'd say never give up. You know, we are the change the world needs to see. And by leading by example, that's how we make a difference. We need to remain confident and make sure that our ideas are being heard. No matter what comes our way, we should always remain optimistic and find a solution. Whenever you have a taboo, it breeds fear and bias. And I hope to continue to fight that. And it may not be an easy journey, but it definitely will be rewarding when I see how many barriers we've overcome to get where we are. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work, for your words, for your comments, for your passion. Um, I'd like to um, turn a little bit towards another aspect of uh, what the Maltz Museum stands for. And as you know, and you heard Milt talk in his remarks, and I've heard him say this many times in person, that it was an experience he had with anti-Semitism that has motivated him and Tamar so much in their lives in support of all of the work of Stop the Hate. And so I'd like to uh, direct this to Janan, um, who wrote um, about the harm caused by Islamophobia um, and the call that you feel to educating people about Islam. And I was wondering if you could talk to us about whether, you know, what other Ohioans can do to help break down the barriers of fear and polarization um, and make our state a more welcoming home for people of all faiths. Yeah, um, one big advice that I have is for people to be enlightened more about Islam and by basically asking questions, um, feeling free to, um, if you ever see a Muslim, go up to them, ask them, um, you know, just be polite with it, tell them maybe I'm just curious about something like this. Um, also, uh, like visiting a mosque, uh, the holy place where uh, Muslims pray. And by all means, like, please come join us, um, any of you uh, at our local mosque, just to explore what um, the Islamic faith is all about. And breaking the barrier, um, I truly believe, is like the is basically just realizing that Muslims are an integral part of our society and just feeling more comfortable about uh, and being around Muslims. Um, and then like one thing like we could just make, which is really easy, but it would probably make a big difference is basically just on our two uh, Islamic holidays, we should make them a national holiday. This, is, this could help people just appreciate the religion, maybe be more interested in learning about it and things like that just to help them. And then um, I'll end with a verse from the Holy Quran. Uh, I'm going to read it in Arabic and then I'll tell you the translation. يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير. And basically what that's saying is um. God telling us, oh, people, we created you from male and female, and we made you races and tribes so that you can come to know one another. And the best among you uh, before God is the most righteous, and God is knowing and aware. Thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, I've been involved in Stop the Hate for a very long time now, and um, that was one of the most special moments I think that we've ever had. So thank you so much for bringing your voice and your song and your prayer to us. That was an absolutely beautiful moment. Um, from a beautiful moment to something that's not beautiful, Tiba, I completely forgot, I glossed over you in our last question. I'm so sorry. Um, so I'd like to ask you, your, your um, story and your words were so powerful. Um, can you let us know kind of your thoughts coming off of what you wrote about and, um, and any advice that you might give to girls or, or young women um, in Cleveland? Um, as for advice, I would just say one of the big things is um, you don't need to stay in dysfunctional relationships. And a lot of people tend to do that because they feel like they need to for them to get the help and everything. Um, but I feel like they can handle life challenges by themselves or the help of their community. 
And that's really one of the big advices I could give. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to um, open up this question to any of you that want to answer. This is one of them in the chat. Um, and that is, you know, what is one thing that you have gained from this experience? The experience of writing about what you have done, the experience of being part of this process, being part of this um, contest. Um, what have you gained personally in this? Feel free to just raise your hand or unmute yourself. I'd love to just get a flavor of, of what this has, what this experience has brought to you personally. Um, can I say something? Yeah, please. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I personally have never experienced any, well, not like any, but like most of um, people's stories that they were telling today, I haven't experienced most of that. And I feel like I was really like getting a chance to be in their shoes for just a couple minutes. And I think just those couple minutes were so important and really impactful and powerful and I think that if we can all listen to each other's stories like we can really learn and grow as a community so thank you to everyone who um wrote an essay today beautiful and I have to say that may be the best description of stop the hate that there is that when we listen to each other's stories we build bridges we create connections um and we inhibit polarization and fear um, thank you so much for those words. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, all right, who else would like to add something in? Feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like. Okay. Lizzie, I, yeah, I saw your hand up. Yeah, great. Um, I, I just want to add on to that. Um, also, the idea of like being more self-aware, I think, after hearing all your wonderful stories, um, it was really inspirational to like understand other people's points of view and like when I, I'm, I'm, I know that now when I go out and I interact with people, I'm definitely going to be more conscious of all these differences, but they really connect us in this way, like in this platform that we are doing here now, that we're here now. And like, yeah, so thank you all of you for sharing your experiences. It was a really beautiful experience. Awesome. Anybody else, something that you've gained from this experience? I agree with Lizzie. Um, I definitely gained a sense of collaboration with you guys. I really enjoyed um, listening to you guys' essays that first time and then once again on this video call because it really just takes you back and like allows you to not only um, listen but also makes, makes, makes you aware of all the problems that go on in society and what you guys have done to combat those problems. So I'm glad that this um, organization has brought us together to collaborate with each other. I also, um, I've just seen how powerful all of our voices are. You know, we just wrote something and the big and humongous impact it's made is honestly incredible. And we've all gained so many new perspectives and we've also given so many new perspectives to everyone. And I think that's the most beautiful thing we've gained from this. Love it, beautiful. Anyone else? Yeah, I would add on to that, that the uh, just the contest is proof that being authentic is rewarding. And when people stay true to themselves, good things will happen. So don't try to change for anyone else or try to conform. Beautiful. Okay. Any, any, um, any last comments at all on um, on this experience, on the evening. Um, I, I will, on your behalf, um, thank the Maltzes who um, so generously created this um, project and this contest. Any last words before we conclude tonight? Okay, I, I, yes. I'd like to have maybe, oh yeah, yeah, Sanjana, please go ahead and then I'll say I one last thing. I would also just really like to thank the Malls Museum for providing a platform for young students like me to share our stories and make a difference. Um, also my parents for providing me an environment that just fosters free thinking and unconditional support. And of course, my English teacher, Mrs. Bartell for supporting <laughs> me with this wonderful opportunity to share my voice. I, I'm assuming that probably all of you have at least one teacher that you probably are, are feeling grateful for. Um, so maybe we'll just throw out a huge thank you to all of the teachers out there who are inspiring and supporting 
um, not all, not just all of you, but all of your classmates. Um, so a shout out to all the teachers. Um, the one thing that I'd like to say to all of you is um, sometimes at the end of a contest like this, it feels just like that. It feels like an end. And I think the, the one thing that I would um, say to you is let this just be a beginning. Let the work that you are doing continue. Um, the, the incredible acts that you've taken and shared with us are a stepping stone to who you are going to be as your life progresses. So you inspire all of us. And I hope uh, on behalf of our entire community that you continue this work. There could not be anything more important in the world. So with that, I will thank all of you. Thank, thank everybody else for joining us. Thank you, the great staff at the Maltz Museum. They've done an incredible job putting this together. Kudos to them. And of course, again, to the Maltzes for making this at all, all possible. And to everybody, have a wonderful night and continue to stop the hate.